be seated.
show on the road. Good morning. Welcome to Chadfield Baptist Church this morning. It's great to see you here in the house of the Lord. We're going to start singing this morning in our hymn book, 193. 193 in our hymn books. Angels from the realms of glory. When we stand together, we'll sing all four verses. 193. service in prayer, sir. Amen. You may be seated. Again, let me add my welcome to you this morning. It's a real joy to see each one of you here this beautiful Lord's Day. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad to have you with us. You're our honored guest. We're delighted to have all of you here with us this morning. Let me mention a few of the announcements that are in your bulletin. Um, choir practice this evening. If you'll note that time, we'll have our Christmas program rehearsal right here in the auditorium at 4.30, and Children's Choir, if you could arrive at 5.20. So note those times, if you will, please, and then, of course, we'll have our Sunday evening service at 6 o'clock. Now, Wednesday evening, we'll be up here for prayer meeting. Uh, we're going through the book of Proverbs. We'll have our CIA ministry. That's for ki children, kindergarten through sixth grade. And then, if you'll note, the youth group will be going caroling and having their Christmas party Wednesday night, uh, leaving the church at 6.30, so make note of that. And then next Sunday, 
Um, please note that that'll be our Christmas program and our Christmas dinner, and there is a sign up in the foyer for that. We hope you'll join us for that. It's something we look forward to every year. It's a wonderful time together. I think the uh, program that we have planned for you will be a real blessing uh, to your hearts next Lord's Day. Now, there will be no Sunday school next Sunday morning, so keep that in mind. No Sunday school, but we will meet at 11 o'clock for our special Christmas program, and then, of course, we'll have our fellowship dinner to follow, and then there will be no evening service next Sunday, so keep that schedule change in mind. We will have our Christmas Eve service. You'll see that on December 24th. Also, if you'll note the insert that's in your bulletin this morning, our carpet renovation we've been uh, talking about for quite a while now, but it's finally coming together. And uh, we're setting aside the week of January 10th to start and hopefully, by God's grace, finish this endeavor. There'll be a lot of aspects of the project that we need help with. And so on that particular Sunday, we'll have Sunday school and the morning service, and then that'll be it for the day because we're going to start the process of emptying out the auditorium here and uh, preparing it for the new uh, carpet. Now, uh, there'll be many jobs that we're going to need help with, so uh, if you men could help us and plan on that today, we'll have to move all the pews out, get the carpet out, prep the floor. There's a lot of things. There'll be some painting and different things involved. So if we can count on your help, there's a sign up in the foyer for that. We could really use your help, and uh, we're excited to see uh, how the Lord's going to uh, bless in all of this. And I think our uh, sanctuary will be beautiful, and we're grateful uh, for this opportunity. I want to read this thank you note to you. Dear pastor and church family, thank you for all the lovely cards, prayers, and meals for us during this last surgery. I appreciate everything more than you know in Christ, Penny and John O'Neill. We're glad to see John and Penny with us here this morning. We missed you. It's a blessing to have you. All right, I think those are all the announcements I have. Brother Steve will come and lead us in our offertory hymn. Thank you, Pastor. 217 for our offertory hymn this morning. 217, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Remain seated. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth.
Let's start your season prayer for the offering. Dear, thank you for this day, and thank you for uh, bringing us all to the Lord's house this morning. Please help us to have open and tender hearts to receive the message, and um, we thank you for all that you do for us, and uh, help help us have a good rest of the day. We just thank you. Two oh two as we continue singing this morning, two hundred and two in our hymn books. Good Christian men rejoice. When we stand together, we'll sing all three verses. The junior church will be dismissed on the second verse. Two oh two.
this time, it's a pleasure to have Kimmy and Amy to come and minister in song. Thank you so much, ladies. Amen. That was beautiful. What can I give him? I give him my heart. And that's exactly what he wants. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 26. Last week we saw Christmas is a season of hope. And today we want to see that Christmas is a season of worship. It's a season of worship. What can I give him? Give him my heart. It's a season of worship. Luke chapter 1 in verse 26, 
And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man, whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Our Father, how thankful we are for the way our hearts have already been stirred and blessed, touched and ministered to thus far in the service. We ask now as we gather around your precious and perfect word, you would use it to stir us afresh and anew. Father, to stir us concerning the true meaning of the season we celebrate, the Lord Jesus Christ, his coming to this earth to save us, such that our sin could be forgiven and we could be reconciled unto thee, that we could be your children and have everlasting eternal life. How thankful we are. And Father, I pray that we would truly worship Thee in spirit and in truth this morning as we read and study and contemplate Thy Word. We'll thank You. Please meet each need of every heart. We'll give You the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that Christmas is the biggest commercial holiday in the United States. Hundreds of billions of dollars are spent around this season every year. Now what that means is this. While Christmas is supposed to be a time of peace and joy, it can become a time of worry and stress, right? And if you and I are not careful, we can get caught up in all of the materialism of Christmas. And in so doing, we can lose sight of the true meaning of Christmas and the true reason that we celebrate Christmas. We can lose sight of the Lord Jesus Christ of who he is and why he came and what he accomplished for us. We can lose sight of God's perfect gift to us. So here's what I want to challenge us to do. I want to challenge us to slow down a little bit and refocus. And I want to challenge us to turn our focus upward to the one whose birth we celebrate. 
I want to challenge us to turn our focus, to set our affection on things above and not on things of the earth. I want to challenge us to refocus and to remember the true meaning and reason and person of Christmas. If we will, it'll help us to move from worry to worship. Because Christmas is supposed to be a season of worship for God's people. Not worry and stress and unrest, but a season of worship as we remember the true meaning, the Savior of the season, the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is, why He came, and what He accomplished for us. You know, seven centuries earlier, Isaiah prophesied these words, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Did you hear that last one? The Prince of Peace. The announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, of His coming to this earth, was to give peace to troubled hearts and troubled lives. Listen, both back in those days and still in our day today. That announcement is to give us peace, bring peace to troubled hearts and troubled lives. And when we understand the message, we understand the announcement, when we understand and we focus on the miraculous message that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to this earth, to die for us, to save us, to deliver us, to not only live with us, but to live in us forever. When we focus, when we remember, then rather than being a season of worry and stress and unrest, it becomes a season of worship and peace and joy that it was intended to be. Last week we saw how the announcement of Christ's birth came to Joseph. This morning I want to focus on how it came to Mary. And I want us to see how his presence brings peace to our troubled lives. How his presence brings peace to our troubled lives. First of all, the message of peace. Notice again in verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. By the way, came at a specific time, to a specific place, to a specific couple. To a virgin, a spouse, to a man whose name was Joseph, and of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, first thing that caught my attention was that this message of peace was given in a humble place. This message of peace that Gabriel brought that day, it was given in a humble place. Did you notice at the end of verse 26 it says, a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now one might imagine that God would have picked a more impressive place for the announcement of the birth of His Son, of the coming of the Savior into the world. Maybe Jerusalem, the city of David, the city of the King. But Nazareth? Nazareth was, uh, it was small, it was poor. It was would have been considered insignificant. There were no trade routes there. It was a, no economic 
uh, significance to the region. I mean, why Nazareth? Why did the announcement come? Why was it given in Nazareth? And I, I thought about two reasons. First of all, because there was a couple there who had a heart for God. It's just that simple. There was a couple there who had a heart for God. You see, we studied Joseph's character last week. We saw that he was a just man, a righteous man, a godly man, a man who kept God's laws. We read here of Mary and her character in the passage we've just read. The bottom line is in Nazareth there was a couple completely surrendered completely yielded to God, committed and devoted to doing His will. And I want to tell you, this is why it's the place God chose to make His announcement. Why? Because there was a couple there who had a heart for God. And you know what it reminds me of? God is not looking for the great and the grand accomplishments of man's doing. You know what he's looking for? People who have a heart for him. People whose worship is directed to him. That's what he's looking for. And in Nazareth there was a couple who loved him, who were devoted and surrendered and yielded to him and to his will. For their lives. Why Nazareth? Because there was a couple there. Who had a heart for God. And not only that. Why Nazareth? Because it signifies. That God had come to all men. And that all men could come to God. That God had come to all men. And that all men could come to God. In other words. Lowly Nazareth, insignificant, poor, small, humble Nazareth was an invitation from God for the most humble to come to Him. It was an invitation for whosoever would and whosoever will to come to Him. You see... The Lord didn't identify with kings and rulers in his coming. He identified with all men. <laughs> and the message is this, Nazareth, all men can come to him. He came to all men and all men can come to him. Never has there been one more approachable than Jesus Christ? Think about it. The announcement came in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. In a, in a manger, in a, in a stable. That was free and accessible to all. What's the message? Jesus Christ has come to all men and all men can come to him. Never has there been one more approachable, more accessible than the Lord Jesus Christ. He came forth as the sinner's friend. As the sinner's friend. Message of peace. It was given in a humble place. And it was given to a holy woman. It was given to a holy woman. Verse 27 says to a virgin. We talked about that last week. Verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And I want to tell you, in an immoral society, when a commitment to moral purity is mocked and scorned, the Bible emphasizes that Mary was a pure woman. And that she was a holy woman. And she stands as an example today of a pure and a holy, of a willing, of a ready vessel that God is willing to use. 
She stands as an example to women today. As you think about her, she wasn't uh, financially unique. She wasn't socially unique. <laughs> but she was pure. And she loved the Lord. And she was a willing vessel for God to use. She sought the Lord in her life. She sought to follow God's will for her life. And that's why verse 28 says she was a woman favored by God. It says, Hail thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Note those two words, with thee. You know what it means? At home in thee. You know what that tells me? It tells me about the character of Mary. It tells me that she loved the Lord. It tells me that she was submitted and yielded and surrendered to the Lord. The Lord is with thee at home in thee. Blessed art thou among women. In other words, she knew the Lord and her heart was focused and directed toward him and worshiping him. Folks, my point is this. It's not by chance that God chose to use Mary. Mary loved the Lord. Mary was committed to the Lord. She was devoted to the Lord. She worshipped Him. And that's what Christmas is all about. It is a season of worship. It is a season to worship the Lord. The message of peace. Number two, I want you to see the reason for worship. The reason for worship. I want you to consider what Mary was hearing from Gabriel. Look at verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. You see, we worship because of his presence. See what Gabriel told Mary there? Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, notice, and bring forth. We worship because of his presence. Bring forth, bring forth into this world. Bring forth into our presence a son, a son, Jesus. <laughs> Thou shalt call his name Jesus. We worship because of his presence, his presence, Jesus. Sweetest name I know as the songwriter has written us written what a lovely name the name of Jesus I told you last week the name of Jesus literally means Jehovah saves literally means he will save Jesus I love his name his name is esteemed it's esteemed it is known from one end of the globe to the other the work the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is known around the globe. His name is esteemed. Philippians chapter 2, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name is esteemed. We worship because of His presence. Not only that, His name is enduring. Begin in Genesis, go to Revelation, and the Scripture proclaims the name of Jesus Christ. That name which has existed from eternity past and will go on forever through eternity present. Revelation 22 and verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We worship because of his presence, his presence, Jesus his name is esteemed. His name is enduring. His name is exclusive. You know why the Lord Jesus Christ is the sweetest name I know? Because it's exclusive. It is the only name through which we find salvation. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. 
Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. <laughs> in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, given among all men, whereby we must be saved. His name is esteemed. His name is enduring. His name is exclusive. It's the sweetest name we know. It's the sweetest name we know. You know, I thought about it. Though we live in a society that treats his name carelessly, even as a curse word, and in a society in which people are offended when we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, you know what? At the name of Jesus Christ, we worship, don't we? At the name of Jesus Christ, we worship. We worship because of his presence. Not only that, we worship because of his perfection. We worship because of his perfection. You know, I thought about Mary. Can you imagine the fear when the, when the announcement first came to her? <laughs> but I want to tell you, those fears were relieved. And all of that worry turned to worship as Gabriel went on to tell her more of God's great gift perfect gift that was coming to man. All of that worry turned to worship. Notice what Gabriel went on to tell her in verse 32. He shall be great. <laughs> Amen. That word great, the Greek word behind our English word great here is the word from which we get our English word mega. That's why we worship him. That's why this is a season of worship, Christmas. His name shall be great. He shall be great. And shall be called the son of the highest. The son of the highest. That is of God. Begotten from of God. He's of God. He's from God. He's deity. He's God in the flesh. That's what that means. Son of the highest. He's of God. He's from God. He's begotten of God. He's deity. He is God. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And of course, we won't go into the details of that, but that was all in direct. Uh, fulfillment of prophecy. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Again, fulfilling prophecy. But notice what it says. He shall reign over the house of Jacob how long? Forever. This speaks of the eternality of Jesus Christ. Eternality is an attribute of God alone. Only God is eternal. Never had a beginning, never has an end. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Eternal. Eternal. Now what's all this mean? What Gabriel was sharing with Mary that day. Well, first of all, it means he is eternal God. <laughs> He's always been. And he always will be. He's eternal God. John chapter 1, I'll remind you of these verses beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, clearly identified as Jesus Christ in, the, in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. The same was in the beginning with God. God, He is eternal God. That's who Jesus Christ is. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, again speaking of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Who is Christ? He is eternal God. Not only that, He is fully God. He is fully God. Listen to Colossians chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 15. Who, speaking of Christ, 
is the image of the invisible God. Do you understand what that means? No man had ever seen God before, and now here's Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. And that's why in John chapter 14, he told, he told the disciples, Have I been so long with you, and yet you ask to see the Father? He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. I thought Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 said, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That's right. He's fully God. <laughs> He's fully God. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Why? Because he's God. And he is before all things. That's because he's eternal God. And by him all things consist. Apart from Jesus Christ, it all fall apart. That's what that means. Why? Because he's God. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Why? Because he's God. He's fully God. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell all fullness dwell in Colossians 2 9 very similar for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily that is in body in bodily form all of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ he is fully God He's eternal God. He's fully God. And he's called God. See, folks, this is why we worship. Not only because of his presence, because of his, but also because of his perfection. He's called God. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, but, uh-oh, listen to this, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. He's eternal God, he's fully God, and he's clearly called God in the word of God. Folks, that's why this is a season of worship. That's why we worship him. He is almighty God come down to this earth to save us. And not only to dwell with us, God with us, but to dwell in us forever. That's why this is a season of worship. Why do we worship him? Because of his presence and because of his perfection. Not only the message of peace and the reason for worship, but lastly this morning, the consent of Mary. The consent of Mary. You see... We read verses 34 through 38, and as you read those verses, you find a principle in Mary's life that we should all emulate and duplicate. It's a very simple principle, and yet it's the key. She believed God. That's faith. She trusted God. And she obeyed God. She believed him. 
She trusted in His Word. I want to tell you, she heard all that the angel Gabriel said to her that day. She believed God's Word and she yielded herself and she submitted herself to obeying it and to allowing God to fulfill His Word through her. She submitted herself to Him. She chose to believe and to obey. Verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, now note her response to all of this. And Mary said, behold, here I am, behold. The handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. (laughs) And the angel departed from her. You know what she did? She consented to the will of God. She consented to God's will. You know what she's saying here? It's very simple what she's saying. Thy will be done. Now I truly believe that the most popular prayer is this. Thy will be changed. I believe that's probably the most popular prayer. Thy will be changed. But I want to tell you the greatest prayer is thy will be done. And that's what she's saying right here. She is saying what Christ said in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was facing the cross. And he said, not my will, but thy will be done. She completely yielded herself. She believed. She trusted. And she committed herself to obeying. She completely yielded herself and surrendered herself to do His will. Basically, she was saying, Lord, I know that you're at work here. I know this is your work. I may not have all the details of it all, I may not understand it all. I may not even know how it's all going to happen. But do with me what you will. Do what you want to through me. Oh, I want to tell you, she consented to God's will. Have you? Will you? She consented to God's will. And not only that, lastly, she consented to God's word. She consented to God's word. You know, Mary's choice came down to this. She had heard it all. Was she going to believe and trust in God's word? Would she believe that everything God had just said and everything God had just promised would really come to pass? Or would she trust her human reasoning? that would say, how could this be? Would she trust her emotions? How she felt. Would she trust herself? Or would she really trust God and trust His Word and submit and surrender and yield herself to Him to be used of Him? Now I want you to listen to a statement I wish I could claim credit for. But Andrew Murray wrote this. He's probably the most prolific writer on the subject of prayer ever. Here's what he said. I want us all to listen, especially you young people, listen carefully. Here's what he said. God is ready to assume full responsibility 
for the life wholly yielded to him. Well, I like that. <laughs> That's good. God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded to him. Now listen, if we will trust God's word, if we'll trust God and we'll trust his word, if we will consent to his will and to his word, I'm promising you something, we will find, we will discover as Mary discovered that God will never fail us. His word will never fail us. And because Mary did just that, she yielded herself to God. She yielded herself to the will of God. She trusted in Him. She trusted in His word. Because of that, listen, think about it. She had a front row seat and the great work of God in bringing His Son into this world. Think about that. Because she believed God's Word and she trusted God's Word and she was willing to obey it, she submitted and yielded and surrendered herself to be used of the Lord. She had a front row seat in God's great work of bringing Jesus Christ into this world. Would you like for God to use you? That's how. That's how you do it. That's why God used her. And when you and I believe God, and we trust His Word, and we're willing to obey, and we submit, and we surrender, and we yield... And we dedicate and devote our lives to Him and to serving and to honoring and to worshiping Him. We, we also will have a front row seat in the great work of God. Today, right now, she had a front row seat. And it caused her to worship Him. Look at verse 46. Look, look at her response. This is a season of worship. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hoped, that means he has helped, his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Her soul magnified the Lord. Her spirit rejoiced in God her Savior. It's a season of worship. When we refocus, when we understand the, the miraculous message, we worship. So I want to challenge you. As you make your Christmas list, <laughs> check it twice. Make sure you're setting yourself up for a season of worship. Not a season of worry. Not a season of worry. Refocus. Turn your heart upward. Turn your focus upward to the one whose birth we celebrate. Remember him. Remember who he is. And I've told you who he is this morning. Remember who he is. Remember why he came. Remember what he did. 
Remember the Savior of the season. Refocus. Trust in his word. Surrender, submit to his will. Worship him. It's a season to worship. Worship him. Let's pray. Our Father, we love you and thank you. We praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, your perfect gift to us, apart from whom we would be of all men most miserable. We'd have no hope and no worship, no reason to worship. How we thank you for Christ this morning. And Lord, amidst all the hustle and bustle of the season when we can get so frazzled and lose sight of what this season is truly all about, help us, Lord, to, to stop, to slow down, to refocus, to turn our gaze, to turn our hearts, to set our affection on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the season, that would move from a worry to a worship, would truly honor and adore Him. Come, let us adore Him this season. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We began with this hymn, we're going to close with it. 193, because it speaks of worship. Worship Him. Let's stand together as we sing.